Registered Phenomena Code 128 Object Class Gamma Red Hazard Types Extra-Dimensional Hazard Containment Protocols The instance of RPC-128 in Authority custody it is to be housed in a standard size B anomalous object locker in Site-004, which is not to be open for any reason outside of testing. Regional Director approval is required for all further exploration in the RPC-128. Location and acquisition of other instances of RPC-128 are to be considered a top priority. Should any other instances of RPC-128 be discovered, they are to be taken into Authority custody immediately, by any means necessary, and transported to Site-004. RPC-128 is a large cauldron, approximately 50 cm in diameter, composed of a material chemically identical to basic iron, which is heavily caked in rust. RPC-128 is anomalous in that it does not have a perceivable bottom inside of it. The interior of RPC-128 stretches downward far beyond the bottom of the cauldron's exterior, leading into opaque blackness. When an object is dropped into RPC-128, no audible sound of the object landing can be heard. The iron-like material that makes up RPC-128 is wholly indestructible, and attempts to directly damage it result in a loud tone measured at 7,000 Hz that lasts for approximately 22 minutes. While the rust that covers it can be removed as normal, it will regrow as quickly as it is removed. While glimpses of the surface beneath the rust have been brief, a can be seen underneath. RPC-128 was recovered from the home of Mr. William, CEO of Technologies. RPC-128 was brought to authority attention after police responded to noise complaints at Mr. Home. A housekeeper had apparently stubbed her toe in RPC-128 and smacked it with their broom in a frustrated gesture, causing a loud, piercing noise that alerted the surrounding residents. Mr. had attempted to tell the officer the cover story, but his suspicious behavior eventually led to a search of the house and the discovery of RPC-128. Authority surveillance of local law enforcement detected reports of the object and took RPC-128 and Mr. into custody, administering a Class B memory wipe to law enforcement officials. Following the results of exploration in the RPC-128, see Exploration Log 128-1 through-3. It is believed there are several other instances of RPC-128 not in Authority custody. MST November 12, Dumpster Divers, Testimony and Review of Recovered Video Footage have led the Authority to estimate there are at least 15 other instances of RPC-128, with more in production. Following a test to measure the depth of RPC-128 through the use of a drone, a definitive bottom was discovered on February 8. Reaching the bottom took 47 minutes to complete at the speed of the drone's descent. At the bottom, a small horizontal tunnel was found, which exits into RPC-128-1. RPC-128-1 is an alternate space consisting of flattened earth, which does not seem to have a discernible end, notable natural landmarks, or alteration of geography whatsoever. For reasons that are not yet fully understood, color cannot be perceived within RPC-128-1 by the human eye or recording equipment of any kind. RPC-128-1 exhibits a further anomalous effect on any photographs or recorded footage taken within it, superimposing images of human faces displaying various degrees of distress, ranging from expressions of pain to sobbing, to furious screaming. These images are animated and recorded footage, and appear to be localized, with specific faces appearing in specific areas. Within RPC-128-1 are several identical structures, each approximately 80 km apart from each other. These structures are roughly egg-shaped, with an entrance tube located near the bottom wide enough for an adult male of average build to fit through. 
The interior of these structures appear to be where items dropped into RPC-128 are deposited. The exterior of these structures, like RPC-128 itself, are imprinted with a large Hartman Group logo, though not obscured by layers of rust. RPC-128-2 are organisms that inhabit RPC-128-1, resembling enormous diptera larvae. RPC-128-2 is resistant to all conventional forms of artillery, despite its soft appearance. When not in an active state, RPC-128-2 instances crawl slowly along the ground, approximately 2 km per hour. When RPC-128-2 enters an active state, its speed drastically increases, reaching estimated speeds in excess of 50 km per hour. RPC-128-2 enters an active state in two conditions, when in the vicinity, seemingly a 5 km radius of one of the structures it has not recently interacted with, or near a human being, radius appears larger, estimated to be 8 km. When RPC-128-2 nears a target, it expels tubules similar to that of sea cucumber from its mouth. When these tubules come into contact with matter that is not RPC-128-2 or dirt from RPC-128-1, the tubules fuse with the target and are dragged back into RPC-128-2's mouth. Should a human being be consumed by RPC-128-2, the creature will emit smoke from its body, accompanied by the sound of the consumed human screaming. Following this process, the anomalous effect of RPC-128-1 on visual recording will display the face of the consumed individual within that general area. After the discovery of RPC-128-1, MST November 12, which specializes in the exploration of spatially large anomalous object interiors, was dispatched to explore RPC-128-1 and collect as much information as possible. All MST team members were equipped with body cameras, and the relevant portions of the recorded footage have been transcribed with Exploration Log 128-1 through-3 for archival purposes. The following document contains these transcripts, as well as other pertinent data related to RPC-128. Exploration Log 128-1 Footage provided by the body camera worn by Agent Peters. Seven minutes into recording. Agent Peters converses with Agent Horowitz, coordinating their planned explorations. Other members of the MST are seen assembling a rover from parts fed to them through the exit tube of the RPC-128 structure. MST Captain Daniel Bronson calls for the attention of the rest of the team. Peters turns to face him, showing other groups assembling rovers and establishing a base of operations. Captain Bronson alerts the group to the fact that compasses do not function with an RPC-128-1, and establishes rudimentary compass directions based on the idea that the structure they have exited from is facing north. Captain Bronson orders all team members assigned to exploration to release the trail paint, which he colloquially refers to as breadcrumbs, before heading out, so that all teams may find their way back to base. During this time, the face of a sobbing Caucasian woman is superimposed on the footage. She appears to move back and forth across the screen, as if walking around a small room, calling out for help. 25 minutes into recording, Agent Peters and Agent White enter a completed rover and head in the direction designated east, activating a device which steadily pours a trail of bright white paint as the rover drives. The two converse with each other about personal matters. This continues for approximately ten minutes, during which time four different faces come and go on the recording. An African-American male, estimated to be in his mid-twenties, an East Asian male child, estimated to be ten to eleven years old, an elderly Caucasian male, and an elderly Native American male. Thirty-six minutes into recording, Agent Peters and White spot another egg-shaped structure appearing into view. White alerts Peters, who also sees the structure. White, who is driving the rover, turns to the right to head in the direction of the structure. The features of the face appearing on camera cannot be discerned 
due to his erratic behavior. 38 minutes into recording, Peters and White approach the structure. The base scene in this area is that of a sobbing African-American female, estimated to be in her mid-teens. White establishes communication with base and states that they found another structure. Captain Bronson can be heard responding, saying that other teams have also discovered similar structures. Peters crawls into the structure's exit tube, but cannot see due to the lack of any source of light, though he states aloud that he smells something unpleasant. Peters crawls out and asks White for a flashlight, stating that he has forgotten his. White chastises him and reluctantly hands him a flashlight. Peter switches the flashlight on and crawls inside. Upon entering the structure's interior, the light from Peter's flashlight illuminates two Caucasian female corpses, both nude, and displaying a great deal of physical trauma. A large amount of blood is pulled around them, and there is a considerable amount of dried blood on the floor of the interior. Peter exclaims, fucking hell, at the sight of this, and begins looking around the rest of the interior, finding nothing else of interest. Peters attempts to shine a light upwards, but the light will not illuminate the upper entrance port. At this point, the sounds of Agent White calling Agent Peters can be heard, and Agent Peters quickly crawls back out through the entrance tube. Upon Agent Peters' exit, Agent White is seen gesturing to the left and demanding Agent Peters look. Peters turns to see an instance of RPC-128-2 in the distance, approaching the structure. The two agents debate what to do for approximately two minutes. Peters wanted to keep a distance from it, stating, we don't know what that thing is capable of, or if it's even hostile, with White suggesting preemptive measures to drive it away, such as shooting it or throwing the contents of the structure out into the open of the lure, before deciding to distance themselves from the structure, and keep watch of RPC-128-2. One hour, seven minutes into recording, Peters and White are in the rover parked several meters away from the structure, and RPC-128-2. Peters keeps his body camera locked on the RPC-128-2, which by this point has reached the structure. RPC-128-2 then presses its mouth over the structure's opening, and its body begins pulsating, as if beating vigorously through the tube. After a few minutes of this, RPC-128-2 releases its mouth from the structure, its body tightening as smoke is released from it. After expelling the smoke, RPC-128-2 begins crawling away. Peters and White decide to wait until RPC-128-2 has left the area completely, before checking on the structure. One hour and fifteen minutes into recording, Peters and White have returned to the structure. Peters takes White's flashlight again and crawls into the structure. A different Caucasian woman's face is now superimposed on the footage appearing confused and frightened. Peter shines the flashlight into the structure's interior, showing that the two women's corpses are missing. Expiration Log 128-2 Footage provided by the body camera worn by Agent Bong Footage begins similar to Expiration Log 1, with the agent assembling a rover and traveling west in the completed rover with Agent Southbury. Relevant portion begins 37 minutes of recording. Agent Salisbury calls to Agent Fong's attention what appears to be a series of objects in the distance. Agent Fong asserts that he sees them as well. A superimposed face is out of focus. Details are too difficult to discern. 39 minutes into recording, Fong and Salisbury exit the rover and approach what appears to be a base camp. It appears unoccupied, though not abandoned judging by the lack of visible weathering. Notably. No face is visible on camera when in the vicinity. Both agents talk amongst each other and conclude that, due to the lack of any signs of a struggle and casual state of abandonment, this base camp must only be temporarily unoccupied, and they'll need to hurry before the occupants return. Both agents begin scouring for intelligence. 42 minutes into recording, Agent Fong examines the contents of a table. There are open soda cans, a manila folder and a piece of paper appearing to be a memorandum. Agent Fong produces a small portable camera and begins taking pictures of the memo, the folder, and the documents within the folder. 47 minutes into recording, Agent Salisbury approaches Agent Fong with a steel case, 
telling Agent Bond to look at what he's found. Salisbury opens the case, revealing what appears to be a chrome-lined Glock handgun, and three magazines. Salisbury removes one of the magazines, and shows the visible ammunition to Bong, which appears to have an iridescent glow to the bullets. The two agents debate on whether or not to take the item. Forty-eight minutes into recording, both agents decide to take the item and return to the rover. The agents return to base camp, driving at full speed. Exploration Log 128-3 Footage provided by the body camera worn by Agent Cortez. Footage begins like the others, with Agents Cortez and Fields together on a rover. Footage consists primarily of small talk. Relevant portion begins approximately 46 minutes into recording. Agent Fields identifies an instance of RPC-128-2 approaching the rover from the right. The instance of RPC-128-2 appears to pick up speed in an attempt to catch the rover. This prompts Agent Cortez to push the rover to top speed. Due to the speed being traveled and frequent motion blur, the superimposed space cannot be identified. 47 minutes into recording, RPC-128-2 is noticeably gaining on the rover. Agent Fields decides to ditch the rover, telling Agent Cortez to return and call for reinforcements while he distracts the creature. Agent Cortez protests, shouting, You can't take that thing alone! Agent Fields dives out of the rover, rolling as he hits the ground. Agent Cortez turns the rover sharply, causing it to tip over. Footage is shaky and glitched from Agent Cortez's impact with the ground. When video returns, the image of a young woman of indeterminate race is seen communicating directly into the camera. Based on her mouth movements, she appears to be calling for help. Agent Cortez crawls from the rover and rises to his feet. We can see Agent Fields firing at RPC-128-2, dealing with no discernible damage. The sound of Agent Cortez calling for help over his communicator is heard. Communications are as follows. Mayday! 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 This is Exploration Team South. Hostiles encountered. Requesting immediate backup. Hostiles XL. Resisting the sidearms. Mayday! Mayday! May! Shit! Fields! At this point, the RPC-128-2 instance is seen ejecting the tubules from its mouth, attaching to Agent Fields who begin screaming and undergoing spasms. Agent Cortez ceases communication with home base and discharges his weapon at the RPC-128-2 instance, screaming, LET GO OF HIM YOU PIECE OF SHIT! LET GO! Cortez's screaming peaks the audio and causes mild audio distortion. The instance quickly pulls Agent Fields into its mouth and swallows him. The RPC-128-2 instance squirms as if pushing the body through itself. Shortly after, the RPC-128-2 instance emits smoke from its body as the voice of Agent Fields is heard screaming. At this time, the image of the woman fades away, and the image of Agent Fields is now superimposed onto the footage. He appears confused and in distress. RPC-128-2 has now turned his attention towards Agent Cortez who continues discharging his weapon towards it. It takes approximately three seconds for RPC-128-2 to get close enough to Agent Cortez to launch his tubules at him. A loud wet slap is heard as the tubules connect with Agent Cortez and the rover. Agent Cortez screams, shaking violently from the pain, but attempts to remove the tubules. Tubules appear to have fused with his clothing, equipment, and flesh. Tubules can also be seen fused to the rover. Footage begins to twist and turn as Agent Cortez quickly removes his body cam and throws it. Body cam is thrown far enough away that the sounds of this altercation fade into the distance. The woman from earlier in the footage is now seen superimposed onto the footage. She appears to be further away and sobbing. Though the camera is laying on the ground, facing directly upward, the image of this woman is from the perspective of someone standing upright. Fifty-two minutes into recording, several rovers with armed MST agents drive by and over the body cam. One hour and twenty minutes into recording, sounds of MST agents on foot can be heard, as well as faint sounds of Captain Bronson giving orders. One hour, thirty-two minutes into recording, 
Silence is broken by the sounds of an agent shouting, We got a body cam! Body cam is lifted by agent, and walked to Captain Bronson. Upon being handed the body cam, Captain Bronson presses a button that ends the recording. Bong Salisbury recovery results. One memorandum, bearing the Hartman Group logo, photo replica, transcribed below, recovered by Agent Bong. One manila folder, labeled Pot Project, photo replica, recovered by Agent Bong. Seven documents found within manila folder, photo replica, contents redacted, level 5 clearance required, recovered by Agent Bong. One bottle of currently designated RPC. Recovered by Agent Salisbury. One standard Glock pistol, with custom chrome lining. Recovered by Agent Salisbury. Three Glock magazines, containing unique ammunition. Ammunition is currently undergoing analysis. Recovered by Agent Salisbury. Transcript of Memorandum From the desk of Salvatore Masato, Head of Product Development. Michael, as you know, the disposal cauldrons have become a bestseller in our Executive Privileges branch. Well, I am excited to inform you that Mr. Hartman is looking into expanding your disposal system beyond just oversized pots for our more wealthy customers, and into the mass market. He can already see the great potential in your design for a wider consumer base. There is a bit of a problem, however. The process of bridging your cauldrons into the dump is an expensive one, and if we want to see any profits from this expansion, we're going to need to find a way to reduce development costs. Some other form of disposal besides these large cauldrons. We are aware that the larger opening benefits some of a more unsavory clientele, but if you need to reduce the size of these more mass-market disposals, that is acceptable. Besides, if these men are willing to pay more for disposal they can fit their dead wives and prostitutes into, that simply means higher earnings for us. The brand managers are all clamoring for a piece of this pie, Michael. You are, without a doubt, the goose laying your golden eggs, and this could mean big things for you at the company. Should this expansion prove successful, you may end up earning yourself a seat on Mr. Hartman's advisory board. He sees a lot of promise in you. Also, we will be sending you a shipment of firearms equipped with AC ammunition. It has come to our attention that the disposal habits of some of our customers have given the cleaners a taste for human flesh. Many of them are not as docile as they once were. Should you encounter a more uncooperative cleaner, this ammunition should be capable of piercing its hide. Good luck.